Hallelujah. Amen and amen. To Elohim be all the glory and honor. You know, the Lord is good and the Lord's mercies endure forever. We bless him for the privilege of coming to him to receive from him what he has for us today. And we ask that every one of you, please, if for any reason you monitor and the sound is not as good as it ought to be, please, you can just send a text and destiny will take care of it. Brothers and sisters, before I go on today, I just want to say this. I have an announcement at the end, please, so stay on. Today, Cos 111, The Kingdom, Lesson 25, we're going to be looking at the expanded understanding of the One Kingdom Nation. The Kingdom Nation, which is the collective of all those who have enthroned Yeshua as Lord over their lives, we want to look a little bit deeper. We've talked about it across a few lessons, but we want to do some inward looking into it to see what the Lord will say to us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, let your name be glorified and feed us with your word. Grant us understanding and let your name be glorified. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, one of the things every believer must know is that it's not enough to believe on Yeshua. It's not enough to say I'm a believer. Which Jesus are you believing on? Is it the one that justifies all manner of evil people do in his name? Or is it the one that is the king of kings and the lord of lords? The holy, thrice holy one. The one who is part of the Godhead. Men and brethren, listen to this. The Yeshua we're talking to you about is the one the Bible presents as the king of the kingdom. That there is one single indivisible nation on earth he is king over and it doesn't matter where you are whether you're in china whether you're in india whether you're in africa whether you're in north america or everywhere he is the king of the kingdom and we all are his subjects all of us who have enthroned him in our hearts we are one kingdom nation men and brethren and so the lord wants us to understand that one of the grand failures of christian religion is that it causes the believers to be in a state of motion without movement. And so what happens? The basic operating system of Christian religion is inherently faulty. Believers are taken to theater, so to say, you know, to watch religious equivalents of muppet shows where a man or woman of God is on a pulpit, prancing around, staging around, displaying his clothing and all that he has. And then, you know, in the end, it's just about people gathering onto a man. And so, when pastors get together, one of the things they acknowledge is that most times, when pastors have pastors meeting, you'll be surprised what they discuss. The ultimate if you want to summarize it, it's what 2 Timothy 3, 7 says. The people are ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because people can stay in church for 5, 7, 8, 9 years, 10 years, 15 years. They don't understand the basics of the kingdom. Because the kingdom was not taught them. What was taught them was a religious system that is inherently faulty. Let's look at Babylon's enduring DNA in Christian religion, which is called Christianity today. You know, with its roots in Babylon, religion raises leaders in the mold of the original founder of Babylon. The original founder of Babylon, the man who inspired Babylon originally is Nimrod, the man Nimrod. Go to Genesis chapter 10 and read a little bit about him, especially 8 to, uh, 8 to 10, verse 8 to 10. What was he? The Bible calls him a hunter of souls. I mean a hunter, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Was he hunting for animals? No. What did the Bible mean by a hunter? He was a hunter of souls. What did he do? He was the first person to break the bound of his habitation, to go into areas and subdue people, take away purpose from them, and then rule over them. So also, that system where a man will subdue other people 
and take away the consciousness of the Lord and his kingdom from them and make them to serve something else, thinking they are serving him. That's the same principle. So that's how we found ABC Churchianity. my own this, my own that. That's not purpose. No, that's ambition. That's what it's called. Ambition is what you want that will give you satisfaction and pleasure. The kingdom is simple. And in this present time we are in, the kingdom is very simple. It's not about building. It's not about money you make. It's not about attendance. It's about making disciples of nations, of cities, one person at a time intentionally getting involved in making disciples and then empowering those disciples to come to a place of maturity as sons of Elohim and coming to the place where you also, you know, enable them to be priests after the order of Melchizedek. If you can do that with only two people, in the sight of Elohim, you are greater than one who has built a mega church where the people are coming to drink milk doing ABC churchianity. So, brothers and sisters, we got to know the last day will be very terrible. A lot of people will hear, depart from me, I don't know who you are. Then those who will make it to the kingdom, a lot of people will be surprised all their works burnt up. Why? The framework. Trying to do the kingdom work with the mold of churchianity is terrible. Yeshua said it doesn't work. You can't take new wine and put in old wine skins. You can't take a new cloth and use it to patch an old cloth. Brothers and sisters, Babylon is about leaders whose job is to hunt for souls, hijacking destinies away from kingdom into personal purpose. So everybody wants to have his own purpose. Everyone wants to... This, people become statistical entries in the church and the church membership will just start. Come here. The gospel is about going here. It's about reaching out to all. Brothers and sisters, these things are not convenient truths to tell people. They are not convenient at all. But the truth is that a lot of people are doing the exact opposite of kingdom. The Lord is not going to heal them on the last day. Thank you for disobeying me. Thank you for doing the things, the, the work of the kingdom with worldly method and systems. No, men and brethren, emphasis of Christian religion is the empowerment of the pastor or the person who is the male, male or female who is the the founder of the organization and the believers rotate around that person as an individual and they, they are not empowered, they do not know the truth because they are given a little sop, a little bit, a little bit, just enough to keep them coming for more and they can never ever understand enough to understand what the Lord wants to do with everyone. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter whether it's the Orthodox system, the Pentecostal, charismatic, the, 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 the evangelical, this is the basic operatives. That's why when people go to Bible college, the ambition is stirred up. They just want to start on their own organization because it's about if I can get enough people, I can build a big cathedral. If only then this kind of money will come. And some even people make projections how much you can make in a year. And they become the metrics of success. How terrible. Brothers and sisters, this is not surprising because when Rome emerged as Christian religion in the fourth century. Some things he did were very telling. He took out the governmental system Yeshua ordained for his church, which is the fivefold, and replaced it with the papacy at the global level, the bishopric at the diocesan level, and the professional caste like male priesthood at the parish level. And secondly, he took away spiritual gifts as the basis of life and ministry. And they replace it with religious works or rituals which you do inside building. And so the 
the result is that the knowledge of the kingdom as enshrined in the Holy Scriptures was replaced with cactisms and dogma sanctioned by the infallible leaders. The result is that people began to gravitate away from the truth because the Bible was closed. You didn't, you couldn't read the Bible. You are not qualified to read the Bible. Only those who have been 11, 14 years in training as seminarians could read the Bible. And this is what the mainstream Protestantism inherited. And many pastors are not checking to the root of this thing. They are not checking, brothers and sisters. That's why we want you to understand why the DNA of what we do is the TTL process, teach, train, equip, activate, release. That you can get into purpose if you follow this assiduously, if you can concentrate and truly understand and then when you are released, you know what? You need to know that the kingdom is one. And if it is so, then the issue of my own, your own, doesn't arise again. It is, what is the king's work? What is the king's agenda? So if the king has given something and connects you to it, take your place and do it to the best of your ability as unto the king, not unto the person who you are working with. He or she is irrelevant. These are principles. And because people violate these principles, that's why people are running around in circles. There's so many unfulfilled dreams. Believers are dying before their time because they don't understand the principles of the kingdom. They mix it up with the things of their culture. So people go to want to do the kingdom with the European mindset, with the African mindset, with the American mindset. It doesn't work that way. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that whereas churchianity and denominationalism have an inherent tendency to carve out the body into mutually exclusive enclaves and sects, the DNA of the one true kingdom church is totally different. The kingdom church is one because its head desires it to be so. He established love and unity as irreducible minimum for participants in the kingdom. John 13 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another uh, as I have loved you. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. Then in John 17, 20 to 23 says, Neither pray for this alone, but for all those who shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, I in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That's the level of unity, that we are one in one in each other, the same way he is one in the Father. That is why the Lord wants us to know. The greatest difficulty you can have in really practicing the gospel of the kingdom is when you carry an old mindset. When you carry an European mindset, an African mindset, Asian mindset, American mindset, and you want to do the kingdom, it doesn't work. Brothers and sisters, when we really get to where we ought to, you know what? We're going to receive each other as members of the same holy family of Elohim in the atrium, regardless of their church affiliation or, you know, ministry affiliation or geographical locations. This is so foundational. As Elohim ordained it, all saints constitute, all saints collectively, they constitute seven things. One. All saints are the body of Yeshua in the earth realm. Number two, all saints collectively are his church. Number three, all saints collectively are his family in the earth realm. Number four, collectively, all saints are ambassadors of his kingdom. Number five, all saints are to function as a single global kingdom nation. All who have truly received Yeshua and enthroned him. Number six, collectively, all saints who understand these things, they are the royal priesthood who continue the Melchizedek priesthood that Yeshua came to establish in the earth realm and is gone to heaven as a high priest and is praying as a high priest, is interceding for us. Number seven, everyone that is part of what we've described Though in the world, they are not of the world. They are in the world physically, but they are not of the world spiritually. Amen and brethren, that is why we need to understand 
that that's what John prayed for, like we saw yesterday, that the Father will keep us away from the spirit of the world. That though in the world, we are not of the world, men and brethren. And that's what Peter meant when he said in 1 Peter 2, 9, May you a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show for the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which were not, in time past they were not a people in time past, but now are the people of Elohim, which had not obtained mercy, but now obtain mercy. Then he said, abstain dearly beloved, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which were against the soul. So it's so important for us to realize that the Lord has put us in the air dream as one. But you know what? Because of our foundations in churchianity and religion, many of us are not able to get the oneness, the reality that we are one. We are one. Rather, people are still looking at each other. I'm from such and so country. I'm from such and so uh, denomination. I'm from such and so. And so the division and divisiveness which is the fault of Christian religion, people are carrying it into the gospel of the kingdom. And that's why there's not more gelling going on. There's not more gelling going on. The way it ought to be, one kingdom nation, men and brethren, that is why the Lord wants us to know the absolute importance of the fivefold. The kingdom church functions on a separate paradigm from the pyramidal structures of religion where individual founders sit as lords coming to lords, receiving obeisance. I've told you what happened. When some years ago, I went on a trip to Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, Abidjan, and in that com they had this mighty throne like chair, two of them, and they wanted me to go and sit up there, and I said to them, brother, listen, by the grace of the Lord, where I'm sitting is fine, in the front row, you know, worshiping, with the others, please spare me that. And they were gracious. They spared me. They didn't go demand it. Not quite long after, I went to an European country, and in the midst of worshiping, somebody tapped me. It was the host, a bishop. He says, uh, "Let's go up." I went. I said, "I'm okay here." You know what was up there? Two thrones, one for me, one for him. I said, "Brother, please, I'm sorry." I'm not able to go there and sit here. Yeah, okay, listen, brothers and sisters. The brother took offense and hasn't spoken to me till today. Cut off entirely for not going to the throne. I was privately speaking with him. Say, please, spare me. Brothers and sisters, those of you who've come to London, you know we sit behind. Pastor Grace and I, we sit behind. We don't sit in front. Neither do we sit on an altar. And these are consecrations the Lord requires us to make for the sake of our assignment and to not to exalt ourselves. Brothers and sisters, this idea of people looking to be exalted, for people to call you my Lord, call you his grace, and you accept it, people to come and bow before you, even, you know, do obeisance to you, and you receive it, even in the house of the Lord, Lord have mercy. Brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to come to a place to realize the reason why the devil has fought the fivefold. He knows that if the true fivefold truly minister to the saints, I mean, every saint should receive the ministry of, you know, teachers, the ministry of uh, pastors, the ministry of, you know, uh, uh, evangelists, the ministry of prophets, and the ministry of apostles. If you receive them truly, something will happen. You'll be empowered to be all the Lord wants you to be. You get to know your part. And you get to know that, yes, just as the fivefold, there are five fingers of the same hand. You can't go play independent, go do your own stuff. No, five fingers of the same hand. And the Lord did it so. That leaders across the world will be connected to any unit of the body where the fivefold are working for the safety of each of the folds. And then the people that they lead, the outcome is in Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what reason? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, 
for the define of the body of Christ. Let me explain to you. Three in one. The fivefold is given to perfect the saints. And the saints who are perfected will do the work of ministry. And then the body will be defied. That is the divine plan. Till we, till, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Yeshua, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That when the fivefold is properly relieved, received, the, the gospel of the kingdom will, will be able to achieve its intended objective. That is why every erroneous use of kingdom to create a pseudo kingdom has been based on a man or woman who cuts the fivefold aside. And that man or woman is everything. Everything is the pastor. Is the teacher, is the apostle, is the prophet, is everything. So the people come to him from all over the country or the world to that person. The pseudo kingdom, the chief apostle of the pseudo kingdom movement, that's how he deceived the world and said, Don't preach Jesus, preach the kingdom. Jesus didn't preach himself. Can you imagine? And human beings who say they are born again, spirit filled, bow to him. And accepted the lie from the pit of hell. Mature Christians got swept away. Why? The moment you take away the fivefold, believers are standing on shaky ground. They are standing on sandy ground. That is why Satan hates the fivefold. Brothers and sisters, when we understand the fivefold and receive it, there will be such maturity that people will be who come to a place where they, they grow up into Yeshua in all things, according to Ephesians 4.15, and as they grow up to him into all things, then they grow up into each other. That's why the devil will do everything to deceive people away from fivefold environments. Go and do your own stuff. Go and do your own stuff. And can you imagine what is happening? How brethren are splintering across the world, across the world, Instead of building up what the Lord is doing and from there growing. Because the normal thing is, you know, it, let me give you an instance. The brethren, for instance, who are joining us from Africa, you know, Zimbabwe and other countries. You know, what we want to share with them is as, at what point will some of you get together and discover the different graces you have. Those of you who are prophets, evangelists you know, pastors and teachers, and if the Lord raises apostle, praise the Lord, at what point would you get together and bring your gifts together and say, no, we're not going to do religion like other people. At what point can we say, Zimbabwe, let's do, let's be together, the five-fold assembly. At what point can you get together and say, let's be so for South Africa. What you are seeing, those who are coming to the Rise Online Church without wars. At what point will the brethren from America say, you know what, this is a good thing, we further it down. At what point, that's what we, that's what we are thinking. We're not thinking of owning anyone. No, people who come. We are trusting the Lord that as he matures them and they grow, they have the hunger to further it in the areas where they are. And that's the way of the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, the fivefold is the governmental system Elohim put in place for his church. And the more you mature, the more you know that you need to receive from the fivefold regularly and consistently. And some may not be fully there yet, but you know what? Even if it's baby level or youth level anointing, the grace is still the grace. And the Lord wants us to know that Ephesians 4, 1 to 6 is still the gold standard. We have one Father. We have one King. We have one Lord. One Spirit binds us. So divisiveness can never be of the Lord. The spirit of divisiveness can only be from religion. And so, brothers want us to know, the Lord wants us to know that no saint in any location, community, city, state, or nation should suffer unduly 
in this kind of setting, if we truly get it right. The reason is that there are brethren close by or far off who are sensitive to the spirit and aware of their mutual identities in the kingdom of Elohim and, 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 and therefore they have a response to one another. When I look at how people try to destroy International Missus Fellowship, I have pity on them because I, I know that with all that the Lord has taught me, it can only take a satanic inspiration to try to destroy a manifestation of what the Lord wants to build in the air tree. That the Lord is building something where we are connected. We had a brother who was the president of IMF in a particular nation and passed on. The brethren in some nations got together. And you know what? The widow has had enough resource to start business to take care of herself and her family. And she didn't know any of them from Adam. The only thing is that they are connected to the fellowship. So also other things the Lord has been doing. Beautiful. So why would somebody want to destroy this? Why would somebody want to take a knife and cut this apart and slice everything apart? No, it cannot be of the Lord. So brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to embrace the kingdom governmental system in any city where you are, in any state, in any nation. Look for a way the Lord will use you to be an instrument of bringing together. And that even shows you the discipline of unity. It takes unity. It takes, it takes real humility to be able to desire to work together, to desire to work together with people. It takes real unity. It takes real humility. And the Lord wants us to know that many sins have died before their time. Many sins have been swept away by abject poverty, sickness, and problems because their pastors couldn't help them and didn't allow them to tap into grace. Let's say somebody has HIV and there's a pastor in the same city or nation who has grace to deal with that. Or let's say COVID-19, a pastor has grace to pray and people get healed. A pastor knows this. When a pastor has somebody suffering COVID, you cover him. You don't want him to go to get the other person so you won't lose him to the other person. And the other person who will, give, who will release the anointing, you don't need to take over somebody's uh, other servant, I mean a brother who is in another ministry. The free flow of grace is supposed to be such that you should be able to refer. I remember, you know, when we in Africa, the ministry the Lord gave to us then was peculiar, unique, it was a unity to bring people together and to disciple believers Somebody will come to me and seeking, you know, to, you know, deliverance as he's coming and speaking. I'm just texting or writing out the name of, you know, maybe one of the deliverance ministers I know that will not spend time. Okay, I may spend two, three hours to deal with an issue, but this person, this brother may need to take only two minutes and he's done. That's his anointing. So why would I spend 30 minutes, one hour on something that, uh, 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 evangelist Paul Akaden, something it would take two minutes to. It doesn't make sense to me. And so, brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to know a lot of believers have died before their time because this denomination, this denomination, you closed up there. There are a lot of sisters who are not able to get suitors for marriage because everybody's in a little pocket. There's no interaction in the body. A lot of young people, they don't have anybody they know. That's one of the things that gives us joy with the London Metropolitan Forum as a model where young people who are 18 to 35, they're able to interact, communicate, study the word, and see how they can impact society. And in the process, you don't know what the Lord may do and show people who will be their suitors. These things must be intentionally embraced. That's why the Lord wants us to know that we need to die to self. We need to die to ambition. Ambition and vision, they look alike. People say, I'm going to pursue my vision. No, a lot of times people are going to pursue their ambition. Ambition is of the earth. It's earthly. Ambition is of the flesh. Vision is from heaven. The Lord will never give a vision that will destroy the body. Take that to the bank. He will never give a vision that its effect is to destroy the body. So when you are going to lacerate the body, 
Let's say you are in a ministry that has the fivefold. You want to go and start your own, and your own is to go and now start your evangelistic ministry. And every day, evangelistic, every day, evangelistic, the people will ever learn and never able to come to knowledge of truth. And you have no, uh, no desire, no burden that the Lord will use you to bring fat a fivefold. No, you want that one so that all the tithes and offering will go into your pocket. So you'll be the Lord of that place. That's your what is driving you. People may not know it. Brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to know. He knows all things. He knows the depth of our heart. He knows the motivation behind everything we say and do. Nobody can confuse the Lord. Nobody, no human can confuse him. The Lord is on his throne. He sees. His eyes are running to and fro the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those who will truly embrace his kingdom truth. I want to say this to you, brothers and sisters. It's time to know that the Lord has good thoughts for his church. So what happens when the governmental system of the church that the Lord gave is in place? Number one, all saints will come into understanding of their individual identities in Yeshua as members of his body, citizens of his kingdom, who are truly subject to him by his resident indwelling Holy Spirit. All saints will come to that understanding. When the fivefold work is done, the apostle does his work, the prophet does his work, the, the evangelist does the work, pastor does the work, and teachers do the work. You'll see them. that understanding of identity will come forth. Number two, they can know their spiritual gifts and use him to build up other saints, not just members of other of their own denominations. The people able to use their gifts to build up every saint. Spiritual gift is not is not particularized to your denomination or your church family or the building. No, your spiritual gift will make a way for you anywhere in the world. Number three, they willingly submit to growth in Yeshua from believers. They, be, they grow to become disciples indeed. Then they don't stop there. They press into deeper rooms of intimacy with Yeshua as friends. And then not only that, they grow further to be and live as sons of Elohim, neither male nor female, mature, taking responsibility. And then they also are trained to become priests after the order of Melchizedek. It's a divine program. It's in the Bible. And you will see it. In a lesson to come, we we'll probably will deal with this transitioning. From unbeliever, you become a Christian born again. Member of the family of Elohim. You press on to become a friend of Yeshua. You press on to become a son of Elohim in practice and in truth. You press on, you know, to become a priest and king after the order of Melchizedek. Number four, saints use their gifts and callings as ambassadorial credentials to function within the earthly nations they are planted or sent to. They use them to occupy, to occupy, to do kingdom business. You know, look at Luke 19, 11 to 27. Number five, saints live in the reality that this material world and time is not all there is to live, to, is not all there is to life. So they willingly surrender their ambitions and self-reliance to seek for the kingdom to come and its righteousness. They entrust their whole lives and needs to the wisdom and benefits of their king, as Matthew 6, 19 to 34 says. And number six, since no one knows the day or hour the king will return to set up the manifest kingdom, through saints live as the wise virgins of Matthew 25, and knowing that it's appointed unto man wants to die after that the judgment. Number seven, because of these things, as they seek the as they seek the things of the kingdom. Their whole lives and all that concern them are hidden with Yeshua and the Father. So they enjoy double insurance. This is the Father. This is Yeshua. This is them. So Satan, sin, the world cannot get at them. Colossians 3, 1, 2, 3. Brothers and sisters, ultimately, Yeshua is looking for vessels who Holy Spirit will use to deliver saints within their loops of influence from the party and sectarian ways of Babylon. Babylon is about division and divisiveness. This does not mean there will be no local assemblies or congregations. There will be local assemblies. There will be congregations. It is rather that saints will get to understand our common identity in Yeshua, embrace each other, intercede for each other, sharing, caring as one single indivisible kingdom nation. 
brothers and sisters, I want to say this to you. You know, I don't know who in the United States of America, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, please, can you come? Let's work together and build a five-word assembly for the nation. And thank the Lord for what is going on in GPRC, Texas, is a typical example where the Lord, through training, and through consistency and persistence, you see the five for the imagining local assembly. And this should be the gold standard. It should be the norm everywhere. And you know what? We can get this thing started on a virtual basis. Brothers and sisters, walking in due diligence as unto Elohim, the glorious gospel of the kingdom will be preaching all the world for a witness unto the day, until the day of days. That's why the Lord is wanting us to know these things. Those of them from Africa, we want to work with you to make sure these things are extended. The grace of the Lord is available. And the Lord wants us to know that he loves us dearly. So let's take some assignments today. Number one, please identify any three negative features of religion discussed in this lesson. Any three negative features of religion you can locate in this lesson. Two, please discuss this lesson and share five things which impacted you the most. Five things that impacted you the most. Three, how would you structure the ministry if you, if you were the vision holder? How would you structure it? Then four, summarize the seven outcomes when the kingdom governmental system is in place. Brothers and sisters, this evening, two o'clock Eastern time, 1 p.m. Central time, which is 7 p.m. London time, we're going to continue and I want you to pay, pay attention because the Lord is doing amazing things through this course. Make sure you don't be one who listens to one and goes through the other ear. Make sure the word comes in, marinates in your heart, in your mind, and becomes flesh in you and bears fruit. And the Lord bless you. I'm going to pray now then I make an announcement. Father in heaven, your word has gone forth. We bless you. You are so exceptionally loving and caring. You are giving us your word because you want us to walk in the light of truth. Deliver us from religion. Deliver us from error. Deliver us from the Babylonian system and cause us to understand that we are one. It doesn't matter where we are located and help us to embrace the fivefold which is your governmental system and walk in it and refuse to do nothing that is monogift. We give you all praise and all glory and all adoration for you are faithful Without measure, in Yeshua's name, amen and amen. Brother, sister, before I leave, I just want to make a short announcement. You know what? Yesterday, Apostle Ron was 61 and being brother, indeed, connected. You know, the Lord led him to raise funds for authentic kingdom culture. Last year, he, during his bad day, you know what? He raised funds and it helped us to take care of 17 orphanages across the world. And... By the grace of the Lord, when you added widowhood organization, widows, that offering raise supported about 25 or 26 people. I mean, entities. Some of the widow organizations, each of them ministers to at least 300 people, each of them. So this year again, it started yesterday, it raised up, and already almost $800 have been raised or more, you know, so far. And I want to say this to you. Please, would you support him? in that noble cause to ensure that Global Missions Board USA is able to touch lives. You can go to the page, Ronald Shepard, Ronald Shepard, and you see the fundraiser chipping a little bit there. You know, it doesn't matter, $10, $5, $20, $50, whatever it is, chip it in. Let this quarter, let there be supplies for those who cannot help themselves. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our sight how the Lord raised the global mission board, starting with my own bad day in 2015 or so, and what the Lord has done since then. And if you have a bad day, why not contact teacher Stephanie, set up a bad day fundraiser. You raise $100 there, you raise 200 you raise 300 you raise 80 It adds up. We have this by expanding need from brethren across the world, we are one kingdom nation. Thank you, Destiny, for being with us. The Lord bless you. Bye-bye.